and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. I'm your host and interviewer, Scott Miller, and each week I'm privileged to talk with some of the world's leading thought leaders, researchers, business titans, best-selling authors, and sometimes people who may even not be a household name, but they conducted some research or survived a trauma, recovered from that, and can tell us how to improve our lives as leaders, as individual contributors, as parents, as uncles, aunts, grandparents, and neighbors. And I'm privileged to continue to host this podcast on behalf of the world's most trusted leadership firm, the Franklin Covey Company. I'm also privileged to be the author of the 10-volume series called Master Mentors, published by HarperCollins. Volume 1, that features 30 transformative insights from guests drawn from this podcast in the first year. A paperback book, Easy Breezy. You can actually listen to an audio and view it on video by visiting litvideobooks.com. Volume 2 has just been released with 30 new master mentors, 30 new insights from this podcast. And who knows, maybe today's guest might be willing to have me feature him in Volumes 4 or 5 on its way to a 10-volume series. I think you would enjoy the Ma Master Mentors series. Today's guest is the Wall Street Journal best-selling author, the renowned physicist, the McKinsey former uh, uh, consultant and coach. You know him as Safi Bakal. His book is called Loon Shots. You've seen this book in every bookstore, every airport bookstore around the world. The book is called Loon Shots, How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas That Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. Joining us from Washington, D.C., Sophie Safi Bacall, thanks for joining us. Thanks, delighted to join you, Scott. Hey, glad to have you here today. This book is fascinating. This is kind of one of the books where you don't read it in one sitting. You read a couple of pages, you put it down, and you think about the application in your world as an entrepreneur, as a solopreneur, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a contributor. The book is masterfully written, researched, arguably, in many cases, the stories you've told, we think we know, we've heard somewhere, but then we read your book and realize, oh, I didn't have the whole story. I, he tells the first part of the story or the last part of the story. So today, we're going to spend our time talking about that. Um, by education, you are a, an Ivy League trained physicist. Um, I've watched every episode of The Big Bang Theory. And to tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure what a physicist does. Made it through college without the torture of that course. Would you reorient our listeners and viewers to what a physicist does for those last few like me who may not know, and talk a bit about your journey that led you to writing this book, Loon Shots. Thanks, and, th and thanks for having me on the show, and that was a, a wonderful introduction. I am, I'm gonna ask for a copy of this so I could send it to my mother to listen to. Uh, you asked what a physicist does. A physicist, it, it may sound big or scary, but it's really just a matter of practice and mindset. You look for patterns patterns that govern how the world works. And a lot of sort of classic physicists in universities look for patterns in, you know, how do metals conduct electricity, you know, patterns in nature, how does the moon, you know, revolve around the earth. But what I did in Moonshots is take kind of that same mindset. What are some patterns? What are some patterns that you see in the behavior of groups and the behavior of teams in the behavior of companies. Why do good teams so often kill great ideas when everybody wants to innovate faster and better? What are some common patterns and common sources for the failure of innovation? Why is so much of the stuff that you read about innovation just BS? The stuff that you read on, you know, these BuzzFeed articles or, you know, even HBR articles and, you know, all these, you know, magic wave of magic wand, you'll innovate faster and better, but so often those efforts fail. Why? And that's what being a physicist, I think, gives gives you some interesting insight. Now, of course, I was a CEO of a public company. And so, um, you know, for the last 20, 25 years, I've been in the business world. But the early training as a physicist, I think, gave me an interesting perspective about trying to understand why there are so many good ideas that get trapped inside the basement of organizations. And I wrote Loon Shots because um, years ago, my father got sick with a type of cancer and I was running a biotechnology company to develop new drugs for cancer. 
And I thought, oh, well, now I'm, you know, in this field, I can do something to help my father pay him back for kind of the, the wonderful dad he'd been when I was growing up. Uh, but unfortunately, nothing I could do helped him. And he died almost six months after his diagnosis. And then over the years, as our company grew and we went public and we started doing large partnerships and spending a lot of time with many different companies, I just kept noticing so many promising ideas that were trapped inside the basement of these large organizations or even small or medium organizations, even though everybody wanted to do something amazing for the world, to treat new patients and so forth, but they were trapped, why? And that's what being a physicist, I think, helped. It, it helped me look for those patterns and come up with some new ideas for how to help companies get those ideas out of the basement and into the world where we could hopefully improve the world, save lives, make people happier. And that's what my purpose was in writing Loon Shots. Safi, as a level set, define in the simplest terms what a loon shot is for everyone. Sure, well, everybody knows the word moonshot, the idea of a big goal, and it came from John F. Kennedy many years ago, let's put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. That's where everybody claps their hand and gets really excited about a big idea. But if you look back over the course of science, business, and history, the big ideas, the ones that really change the world or transform industries, they rarely begin with somebody you know, applauding and saying, let's, let's do this great thing. Usually the big ideas are the ones that are dismissed and neglected and written off as crazy. And in fact, if you look at how we actually got to the moon, although everybody points to Kennedy and say, let's put a man on the moon, the idea that got us there had been suggested 40 years earlier by a man named Robert Goddard, who said, let's put some gas in a tin can and explode it and send it off into space. And everybody dismissed that idea, including the New York Times took an editorial. I said, this person doesn't understand basic physics. But in fact, that's exactly how we got to the moon. And actually, the day after the successful rocket launch to the moon, the New York Times issued a retraction and saying, apparently, uh, you know, Isaac Newton was correct and, and we got our facts wrong. You can fly a rocket in outer space. So it's very important, while it's nice to declare big goals and moonshots, it's the way you get there to these big, exciting destination is nurture these small, crazy ideas. For example, there was a group of scientists that took Robert Goddard's ideas seriously. And that was a scientist in Nazi Germany. And they built on his ideas to develop the first jet aircraft, the first uh, missiles, which the allies had no answer to. And fortunately, the allies won the war for other reasons. But the moral of that story is sure, declare big ideas and big goals to get everybody pumped up. But if you really want to innovate, you need to nurture these seemingly crazy ideas that may challenge conventional wisdom. And there wasn't a good word in the English language for that, so I made one up, moonshots. I love it, it's a great story. There is so much content I want to cover in our next 30 minutes. I want to talk about Francis Crick. Early in your book, you mentioned Francis Crick, who, of course, discovered and won the Nobel Prize with his partner, James Watson, for the double helix structure of in DNA. And Francis Crick was asked by someone what it takes to win a Nobel Prize. And he said, quote, oh, it's very simple. My secret had been I know what to ignore, end quote. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks because it's such an important leadership competency, isn't it? Is in today's society where the onslaught of attention and distraction and information and limitless choices and everyone's a knowledge worker, that knowing what to ignore is probably more valuable than ever before. Riff on that and we'll get further into some of the content in Loom Shots. Absolutely. I, you know, I think that's great. If you want to win a Nobel Prize, that's great advice. But if, you, you know, if you're a leader... If you're an SVP, an EVP, a CEO, a CHRO, it's not only that you want to know what to ignore, but you want to help your followers, other people on the executive team, even your board of directors, and certainly your team, your staff, 
You want to help them know what to ignore. And that's, that's I have identified, in working with a lot of leadership teams and companies over the, the last few years, I see that innovation breaks down inside large organizations. Every CEO, every executive team wants to innovate faster and better. But one of the four reasons that it breaks down is this, is focus, right? The leader says, oh, innovation is great. We need to innovate. Everybody go innovate. And then somebody comes back with a new design for a train. Someone comes back with a t-shirt. Somebody comes back with a credit card. And the leader says, uh, well, not that. Then you have a big problem. You've just told everybody to innovate and everybody comes back with a bunch of stuff and you tell them no. What did you not do? You didn't tell them where to focus. You didn't tell them what to ignore. You didn't tell them yeah, there's all this noise about all this stuff or AI or machine learning or this thing or that thing. Of the 20 areas that we could be innovating on, I need you to ignore these 17. Here's where we will not be innovating. So that's sort of counterintuitive. If you really want innovation, tell people where not to innovate. Why? Because that liberates an enormous amount of energy around those remaining three areas. It's like if I told you, Scott, I'd like you to uh, write me two poems by tomorrow. What are you going to do? Oh, my God, write a poem? I don't know. But if I said write two haikus, five, seven, five syllables each line, it's like, oh, okay, I can do that. So knowing what to ignore, not only for yourself, that's where do you want to focus? What are the three things you want to put your energy to? That's good not only for your yourself in your professional life and in your personal life? What are the three things in your personal life you want to focus on? But a big job of the leader is to provide clarity, vision and clarity. And clarity means here's the things I don't want you to spend time on. You can just safely ignore them. Does that make sense? Completely. In fact, uh, take it a step further. Arguably, the premise of your research in the whole book, Loon Shots, is understanding this concept of why good teams with the best of intentions, with talented people, kill great ideas. I mean, you've done a lot of research on culture, and you write a lot about how a lot of companies get culture wrong, and they, they attribute culture for outcomes, and they may be looking at the wrong things. When you're working with organizations and C-suites and talking about innovation and research and the speed to market, Basically, fundamentally, why do well-intended teams kill great ideas? Sure. Well, the, it really does get to the kind of the, the big theme of what truly distinguishes great companies that I've seen now in working with so many companies in so many industries from media to finance to actually I do a lot of work with the military and intelligence communities, public sector, private sector. There's one thing that distinguishes the companies that eventually become Amazon or Microsoft or Google versus the ones that end up in the graveyard, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the blockbusters or blackberries of the world. And that one thing is their ability to run experiments at pace and scale without dropping the ball on their core franchise. That's a, the reason that that's so challenging. The reason so many companies fail on that is that as they get bigger, as something succeeds, they focus on this kind of one skill axis, which is how do we grow our franchise? How do we continue to get better on our franchise? How do we manage our pipeline of customers so that we get, you know, increase the revenue per customer, decrease the cost per customer, increase the number of referrals per customer? But they stop, they lose this ability to run experiments at pace and scale. And so what I work with them is, why does that happen? Why do good teams kill great ideas? Why inside large organizations does this suffer? Now, there really isn't a, a, a simple magic wand. That's part of the reality is that, you know, you can't wave a magic wand and Monday morning, the whole company is transformed. But there are a couple of principles and that's kind of what I talk about in Moonshots, which is that when you bring everybody together just like a glass of water, right? If you have molecules in a glass of water, most of the time I can stick my finger in and just sort of slosh it around and the molecules will slosh around my finger. But as I lower the temperature, all of a sudden, I get this transformation of the system. The molecules become completely rigid. 
the behavior totally changes. And I can't stick my finger anymore. The, the water freezes. Right now, why do they do that? There's no molecule or CEO molecule with a bullhorn that's saying, hey, the temperature just went uh, you know, below 32. Everybody stop sloshing around and freeze. That gets to the point of structure versus culture. Culture is about encouraging everybody and putting posters on the wall and watch some movies of Kumbaya. That's like telling all these telling each molecule, okay, everybody loosen up. If you go around to a, a glass to a you know a, a, a giant block of ice and and ask each molecule to, hey, could you just loosen up? What does that do? Nothing. But if you do a small change in temperature you can completely change the behavior of those molecules. And that's what Loon Shots is about. What are those small changes in structure rather than culture that can transform the behavior of teams? So where do you know, so many teams and leadership groups go wrong? I think about it in terms of kind of four things. Number one, framework. Number two, friction. Number three, focus. And number four, fear. Framework is when someone has a good idea, where does it go? I actually often, when, when I meet with leadership teams, I do a bunch of interviews in advance and I ask that question. I say, well, I, you know, I, uh, I tell my boss and then what happens? I don't know, usually nothing. Um, when you don't have a framework, what you start to see is for new projects, for the, you know, the ability to run new experiments, what you get is a bunch of zombies you get a bunch of projects that are just around forever and nobody kills them. You get a bunch of sort of lost in the closets. We're at a staff meeting, an executive team meeting, somebody said an idea, everybody got excited, and then you forgot about it, got put in the back of a closet until you, you know, wake up one morning and read that your competitor has started this new business line and you're dead. Or you get these sort of premature scalings, like all of a sudden someone gets excited by an idea and they, you know, spend uh, you know, a, a billion dollars to go buy, uh, go buy a company. I won't mention any examples. Um, you know, let's say some your customer says, oh, I like batteries, and you go uh, buy a battery company for $2 billion, uh, like uh, General Electric did one time. And then you find out that your customers didn't really need batteries from you. So without a framework, without making very clear to people, people will get very frustrated. They don't know where new ideas will go. What is the budgeting decision? Who makes those decisions? What's the stage gating? What, do they, what experiments do they need to run to prove the validity? And so people just give up and get frustrated. So number one, you need a framework. Number two that kills new ideas inside companies is friction. As companies evolve, if you wanna run an experiment really quickly in like one day and $100 to get some data, not you know, one year and a million dollars for a prototype and a launch, but really one day and a hundred dollars. You call up HR and they say, you say, I need to, you know, hire this sort of non-traditional person to, uh, to, to help me run my experiment. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's a couple of weeks. And HR says, great, here's, you know, 80 pages of forms to go through. Or you say, oh, you know, you go to vendor, you, you go to vendor management or purchasing or finance to cut a check. And you say, yeah, that'll, that'll, you know, come back in uh, next spring and we'll have that paperwork done for you. You can't run experiments at pace and scale. So friction is a second thing that kills the ability to experiment at pace and scale. And the really good companies have actually figured out some very clever techniques, how to have two zone management, to have, you know, the rapid zone, the fast lane, and then the protected zone where you are managing a franchise with billions in sales. You really don't want to make decisions. You don't want to move super fast and take high risk. But when you're running little experiments, you want to move super fast. So you do two zone management. The third that we think is focus. And we just talked about, if you tell everybody to go innovate, you get what I think of as spaghetti innovation. Just throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. And that's a disaster and very frustrating for people when they suggest all these ideas and nothing happens. And the final one is fear. And this is something very important for CHROs, EVPs, SVPs to really think about and get right, which is if you are punishing people for failure, 
when they try something new, what are they going to do? Well, they're not going to try anything new. They're going to play it safe. And that's the thing to really keep in mind is that there are the two types of folks, two types of projects. You have your soldiers who are working on kind of on time, on budget, on spec, delivering your core franchise, and you don't want them to fail. It is true. If you have a sales guy knocking on a customer's door and he says, here, sir, here's your toaster. And he said, toaster, I ordered a television. Well, you're not going to have a business for very long. So you have this one group, this one set of projects where you don't want failure. When I work with the army, I talk about making parachutes. You don't want someone experimenting with some new kind of parachute and say, yeah, just go up in the plan. I don't know. Maybe it'll work. I hope it will. No, you want it the exact same way every time and you want to reduce risk. When you're running new kinds of experiments, you want risk. You want failure because most things don't, most important breakthroughs sound stupid at the beginning. They sound crazy. They're loon shots. They look really dumb. And so you want failure. So you need as a leader to wear two hats. To one group, you want to encourage quality and reproducibility and reducing risk. And to another group, you want to encourage experimentation, which means lots of failure. And if you're not mindful about this, you create fear. You create fear of failure. That's actually one of the big things that stops innovation in the military is because people just get rewarded for doing what their superior officer did. So they don't try anything new. So, so if you pivot, to, yes. pivot from that and talk about the, the concept of artists and soldiers inside an organization and how important it is for leaders to quote you to love them equally. Absolutely. So you have these two things and these, these you want your artists who are working on something new, the creators, they see the world in terms of beautiful baby, their project. They have this new idea and they see it like a, a beautiful baby. And I think of this as the beautiful baby problem. The art, whether they're working on a new, you know, design for a coffee machine or a new software code, they see this, their idea as this beautiful baby full of potential. And the soldiers who are responsible for on time, on budget, on spec consistently see the same thing as a shriveled up raisin covered in vomit and poop. And that's a beautiful baby problem. The artists see the beautiful baby, the soldiers see vomit and poop. You want that tension. You need that tension. You want to lean into that tension. If you don't have that tension, you actually have a far bigger problem. If your artists aren't excited by their new ideas, well, what, what kind of projects are you working on? Just blah projects. If your soldiers aren't focused on reducing the risk, then you're just going to have a lot of disasters as you start to scale that program. So your job as the leader is to love those two groups equally. And that's very difficult for a lot of leaders to understand who have grown up one way or the other way. In the military, they very often grow up as soldiers. And so they love the sort of typical soldier on time, on budget, and all the metrics that you need there. And so the innovators, the artists get squashed. But it's exactly the opposite at many companies. Steve Jobs was a disaster, his first few businesses, because he didn't get this, because he did the exact opposite. He saw himself as this visionary artist, so he favored the artist. It's like favoring one child over the other. He said to everybody who's working on this new project, the Macintosh project, oh, you guys are visionaries, you're artists, you're working on the future, and everybody else is a bozo working on this old stuff. Well, those bozos brought in 95% of the revenue of the company. And when the Macintosh launched, it was a flop as a product, and the company nearly went bankrupt because you created so much tension between these groups if you favor one child over the other that they aren't able to work together. And your job, I think of it as be a gardener, not a Moses. Your job isn't to stand up there with a, at the top of the mountain with a staff anointing the holy loon shot of the chosen project. Your job is to manage the touch and balance between these artists and the soldiers. Your job is to love them equally. And anyone who's ever been in a leadership seat knows that you're always signaling. Everybody on your team, the executive team, when you company meetings, Zoom meetings, they're watching 
your body language and your gestures and your words, what's in and what's out. If you signal that you love the artists and not the soldiers, the soldiers will get demoralized and the ship will get unbalanced. And you'll actually never be able to get projects out successfully because the artists need the soldiers, they need to cooperate. And vice versa, if you favor the other side, you again, the ship will be in balance. So the message is love your artists and soldiers equally. Safi, in your book, Loon Shots, you do, uh, again, a masterful job of storytelling and then talking about innovative concepts. You've got some great stories about Nokia. The story about Pan Am has never been told like you've told it before. I want to make sure we save some time to talk about the deaths and the, the Moses trap and such, but would you take maybe five minutes and try to tell the Pan Am story from the beginning to the end, and then we'll pivot into some final concepts that we might take out, including the Moses trap and the three deaths and what you call the false fail. Take some time, tell the Moses story, and then we'll debrief that. Sorry, well, not the Moses, sorry, the Pan Am story. So the, the Pan Am story is an example of what I was just uh, talking about, about a leader favoring one type of loonshot, one type of crazy idea. What got you to the top won't keep you at the top. So Pan Am started with a young guy named Juan Tripp, who was uh, kind of an ambitious entrepreneur, and he wanted to set up a plane taxi. So this was, you know, the 1920s, just after Charles Lindbergh. So you have to imagine way back a century ago and planes were still a pretty exciting new thing. And he was a really, you know, he got a, He liked to get, a, a, he was a pilot who liked to engineer and, and get his hands greasy and do all sorts of um, product things to improve the planes that he was flying. So for example, he uh, wanted to do a taxi to go from Manhattan to the Hamptons an air taxi, uh, which he did, but of course, um, people wanted to go as couples. And at the time there was just two seats, the pilot and uh, one seat in the back. So he sort of chopped off, uh, you know, chopped the propeller down, chopped the wings down while it could still fly and added an extra seat. And all of a sudden he got this taxi service growing. And so he kept doing these kinds of products improvements and until he found uh, a niche that really worked for him which was flying overseas. He started flying to Cuba, started flying to the Caribbean, and pretty soon he was flying to South America. But all the time, he was sort of the first product innovator. And he kept growing and expanding by using bigger planes and faster planes and bigger propellers and more engines. And eventually he became the first guy to use jet engines when everybody said planes will never fly with jet engines. And he became the, Pan Am became the first airline to fly around the world, the first, the first airline to cross the Pacific, the first airline to cross the Atlantic nonstop. And it was the most successful airline in the history of the industry. And it was actually the number two most recognized brand in the world after Coca-Cola. It was, you know, in movies, if you watch 2001 Space Odyssey, it was a Pan Am plane, you know, going to a Pan Am space station with a Pan Am stewardess. James Bond flew Pan Am, the Beatles flew Pan Am. And then it was gone. Kind of what happened? Well, it's what you just mentioned, the Moses trap. Once you are the leader and you, all of you, you have done these product innovations that have helped your company become successful, you start believing that the right way to continue success is for you to keep making product innovations. And that's what Wantrip kept doing. First, he got very successful with the jet engine that helped them become the number one airline in the world. So he said, well, that engine is good. Let's try an even bigger, faster jet engine, 727, 737. And finally, something called the 747. All of these were things that Juan Tripp and Pan Am really pushed into the world. And there were already signs that maybe this isn't the right idea. Maybe we need to start doing some things that aren't product innovations. There was a, you know, a company that uh, named Southwest that was starting to fly regular smaller airlines and they were doing this thing called spoke and hub instead of flying direct. Then there was another airline, American Airlines started coming up with this idea of frequent flyers. 
okay, that's an innovation, but it didn't make the cover of any magazine. There were all these little innovations that started happening, whereas Pan Am got stuck in this Moses trap of a senior leader thinking the only way to succeed is through product innovations. And Steve Jobs was like that for his first 20, 30 years in business until he got to Apple the second time. But Juan Tripp was a, the predecessor of that example. And he just kept thinking, let's just make bigger planes, faster planes, because that's what got us here and that's what's going to win. And so he invested billions of dollars on the 747. And then what happened? Well, you had the energy shocks and you had deregulation. And all of a sudden, he was flying billions of dollars of 747 planes with no passengers. And Pan Am eventually went bankrupt. But the other airlines, airlines like American Airlines, who hadn't, who had been looking at, at different kind of strategy innovations, let's try frequent flyers, let's give away our reservation system that we were using in-house, let's give it to travel agents. And that became, that came from American Airlines, it became known as Sabre. And all of a sudden, American Airlines booking started going up. Well, all the airlines, including Pan Am, went bankrupt after deregulation, except for one, American Airlines. So the moral of that story is, beware the Moses trap and watch your blind side if you're sure that it's just one kind of innovation, product innovation over and over. And this is, I see this all the time in Silicon Valley, where people think I, if we just make this, this hardware gadget faster, better, smaller, cheaper, we will win. And that's wrong. That's exactly what killed Pan Am. This Moses trap and, and um, lack of attention to their blind side, to the other kind of innovation, the strategy innovations, not just the product innovations. And that's why Pan Am disappeared. And that's something that leaders should absolutely keep in mind, especially if you're focused on developing your product and your core franchise faster and faster. You obviously truncated the story for the sake of our time. I found most interesting in the Pan Am story uh, how he identified Pacific islands that he could stop at and refuel and researched, you know, who was managing them, who was administrating them, who had, you know, who had taken them over in previous wars. And he was a quite genius leader in terms of finding innovative ways to conquer the market. And perhaps that hubris, if you will, became the Moses trap. There's two more concepts I want to have you talk about before our time ends. One is you call, quite fun, listen to the suck with curiosity. Riff on that. Sure. So many, and this again is super important for leaders who want to help teams innovate in any kind of project champion internally. There's so much training inside organizations for things like active listening. And I was the recipient of a lot of that training uh, in my day. And the problem with that is that active listening is not enough. And so if you are championing some project and you are, whether it's your SVP or your EVP or a customer or a potential partner tells you no, thanks, uh, not interested. Just saying, I hear you saying you're not interested, thank you. Or they give you some explanation and you repeat their explanation back to them. That's active listening, but it's not really helpful. What you really need to do is put on your detective hat, like Columbo in those old TV shows, and start asking, could you help me understand what here didn't resonate for you? And you've got to understand, just like a murderer, they don't want to tell you because it's a difficult conversation. They like you. They want future business with you. So they don't want to tell you what really sucked. Now, this is why the true entrepreneurs, the one who, whether inside a company or outside a company, this is their kind of superpower skill set. They're able to listen to that suck with curiosity and pull on that thread until they get to the golden nugget at the end. For example, you keep pulling and you find out, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to say, but there's a competitor in you know, Sweden who makes a similar product uh, and they've got this other feature and they're about 30% less price. 
Now, once you hear that, you didn't even hear know about that competitor and you look at them and you're like, wait a minute, I could add that feature. I could also add this other feature uh, because it fits into the R thing and we can do it in a way that lowers the price. Only if you've been listening to the suck with curiosity will you get to that golden nugget. And the reason it's so hard is because of what I mentioned, this sort of beautiful baby thing. When you are an innovator, an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, you see your new project is this beautiful baby and nobody wants to hear your baby is ugly. That's hard. You just want to punch the guy who says that. But it's even harder to keep asking why. Why do you think so? So that requires a certain kind of mindset and a certain kind of discipline to set aside your desire to punch the person in the face who doesn't like your beautiful baby. Set that aside and start to become a Columbo, start to become a detective. Help me understand what exactly didn't work. And that's what I mean by listening to the suck with curiosity. Safi, our time is coming to an end and I want to spend it discussing what you call the three deaths and the false fail. Maybe spend about a minute on each of those and we'll conclude our time today. The three deaths is about the fact that where we kind of started talking about that the really big ideas, the important ideas that change the course of an industry, of your business, almost always seem stupid at the beginning. And they very rarely work. And that's what, exactly why they're important, because your competitors gave up there. And so if there's kind of one piece of advice I like to leave managers and leaders with, it's this. When somebody comes up to you, it might be a young person it might, with a new idea, it might be someone who's been around for a long time, and they come up to you with a new idea. And the thought that goes in your head is, that will never work. I would like you to replace that thought in what comes out of your mouth with the phrase, what experiment can we run? Because the big ideas fail so many times and the three deaths is something that a mentor of mine once told me about when we were working on a new drug project and I was disappointed that it had failed in the lab. And he told me, it's not a good drug unless it's been killed three times. So when someone comes up to you and you've been in business for a long time, you've been in the industry for a long time and you're sure something sounds really stupid and won't work, just say, what experiment might we run? And you never know. So that's the three deaths. And what was the other one you asked? The false fail. The false fail. So that's another thing. When, some, when something doesn't work, because like I said, if it's an important idea, it's probably been killed several times. And that's exactly why it's important because your competitors are giving up and nobody has gotten to that sort of holy grail, which is on the other side of all those failures. And very often they're false fails. So once one example is when uh, Mark Zuckerberg in 2004 shopped his idea for a new social network called the Facebook, almost all the venture capitalists and investors said, oh yeah, that'll never work because we already know that there are all these social networks and they're all just dying because there was a network called Friendster that had built up to a few hundred thousand and a million users and then people were just jumping off to go to MySpace. And so they said, you see, all these social networks are like fads, they last for six months, they're like genes and people switch. And so they all passed. That was an example of a false fail. By a false fail, I mean it's a flaw, not in the idea, but in the test, in the experiment. What happened was one guy went back and saying, well, why is Friendster failing? And he went back and he got the data from how long people were staying on the website. And he found that it was amazing. People were on that website for two hours, three hours, four hours at a time, which was unheard of at the time. But they had a lousy website, it kept crashing. So the fact that people were leaving Friendster wasn't because the idea of social networks were bad. It was because they had a lousy website. They couldn't get the scaling systems in the back to work when they got up to a few hundred thousand users. So that guy whose name was Peter Thiel wrote Mark Zuckerberg a check for $500,000 and he cashed that check eight years later for a billion dollars. 
So that's how understanding what is a false fail. Is this really a flaw in the idea or is it a flaw in the experiment? Matters. I can make you a billion dollars. Safi, with no hyperbole, the book is a masterpiece. Why every executive team leader, senior vice president, EVP, product innovator in the world isn't reading your book, they should be. I can assure you when we hang up, I will be texting our CEO, Paul Walker, to make sure that he is reading your book and digesting it. I might even just buy copies for the executive team and pass them out. Uh, thanks for your time today. What's next for you? Good, I, well, I, I, I'll tell you, but uh, Sky, what I can do is for people who want a courtesy copy, I'm happy to email uh, uh, a free PDF chapter of the first chapter and some other free materials. You can just email me at my first name at lastname.com, Safi at Bacall.com. And it's got the, you asked me about the World War II story earlier. It shows you like what people really get wrong about that story and how you apply these principles in very large organizations um, to actually turn the course of a war. Uh, and what's next for me is I'm, I continue to get like calls every week from leadership teams and CEOs. And I find that fascinating to get into the weeds with them about what are their particular pain points and how can some of these principles help them innovate faster and better. And so I'm enjoying continuing to do that. And meanwhile, there will be a new book with all the stuff that I've learned since the first book about how to help teams and companies do this better. Well, we will be sure to have you come uh, for that launch. Safi Bacall, the book is Loon Shots, uh, enormously valuable. You're a fantastic storyteller for a physicist, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> Delighted to have you on, and we'll see you back here next time for the forthcoming book with round two. Thank you for your time, sir. Thanks a lot, Scott. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.